Okay, so let's start. All right, guys, welcome to episode 49 of the Bearsy podcast. Today, we have a fellow content creator, Corey, from the Stoic Blueprint YouTube channel. And Corey was happy enough to join me on the podcast today. So, hey, Corey, what's going on, bro? How you doing, Derek? Man, I appreciate you having me on. Um, my whole my whole thing is about you know connecting with other content creators, so I'm appreciative of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I started this podcast sort of on a whim, and my idea was to try and have interesting conversations with other YouTubers and try to promote their work. Because you know, as a YouTuber with your own main channel, you're always trying to promote yourself. You yeah. just want to grow. You want subscribers. You want views. But I was thinking, like, I want to try to do something that's a little bit more selfless. And I felt that trying to reach out to other YouTubers that are going through the same struggles that I am is a great way to create content, right, for people that are trying to start something just like this. Absolutely. So you saying that, I always, <clears throat> it's a, the thing about today and what, what makes the internet so great is that you now can make yourself a business, your personality, your likeness, you become the brand versus, um, you know, me actually having a a physical product and actually selling it. So being able to have that control, I think, which is what entices me to uh, YouTube because I'm very entrepreneurial. And um, when I was in, when I was in college, I majored in supply chain just because I wanted to know, how um, the operation side of uh, side of a business actually works, how it actually functions. So whenever I wanted to start my own business, I would be able, I would know, I would be so much further ahead of other people that maybe didn't major in that in terms of success. Um, it's never guaranteed that your, your business is going to thrive, but I felt like if I knew how a business ran from the inside, that my chances would be higher. Um, but I would say around 2019, I, I, I stopped really looking at like trying to start a business because before that, I'll tell you, I had a I had an app with uh, four other people. It was called Giver. So typically when you go up to a person in need, you would give them actual physical cash. The problem is, is that a lot of people don't want to want to give because they don't know what you're going to do, what they're going to do with the money. They're going to use it for the bad habits. They're going to, you know, things like that. So our motto was to um, put faith back into the hands of the giver. So what we would do is instead of giving them physical cash, we would allocate a certain amount of money, however much money you wanted to allocate towards a particular store that was within that area. So if I wanted to give this person a need $5 to, uh, to go to Walmart, they could go to Walmart. If I, I would spend $5 on the app, it would generate a code. They would go to Walmart, get whatever they needed, and they would just redeem that code at the cra- uh, cash register. And they couldn't use it on like cigarettes, alcohol, and things like that. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that that idea had actually won some awards in, in, in Michigan because that's where I went to college. Um, but after that, I kind of, in 2019, I kind of transitioned into my purpose. And um, I'm, I'm very, I'm very studious. Like I like, I love reading. So a lot of the content I create, the, the knowledge comes from the books that I have read. So when I, when in 2019, I always, I've always watched YouTube. Always. I've always loved YouTube. I started getting to a point where YouTube started exceeding like actual TV for me and, and the content that I was uh, consuming. Um, so I love learning. So I was like, man, I should I should pick this up and do it because I had friends that were in jail, in prison, um, and they used to always ask me about books that they should read, and because they knew I read books, so they say, hey, man, I, uh, I I just finished this book. What book should I read next? And I'm like, what are you trying to learn? Because I like to I like to give people direction based off of. What, the type of information you're looking for. I just don't want to give you a random book. So I always ask you what type of information are you seeking? And then I can better direct you towards a particular book. So they would tell me something and I'll say, Hey, you should read this book. This, this book could change your life. And, um, 
I was big in business. So I would post stuff on Instagram about whether it was stock portfolio or whether it was crypto. And people would always ask me, hey, what should I invest in? And I was like, I, I never, <laughs> I never advise, you know what I mean, somebody what to do with their money because I don't want that responsibility. Um, because at the it, it's a it's an educated guess, but at the end of the day, I'm still like gambling. I'm still guessing based off of knowledge that I may learn from news or uh, uh, where I, I see um, technology heading in the future. So I never want to tell people what to do with their money, but I would give them ideas. I will always give them the safe route, invest in the biggest companies, Apple, Microsoft, they're not going anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. So because people would DM me and ask me questions and stuff like that, I was like, man, I should just start creating content since people are already asking me about specific things about how to progress their lives or make their life better. I'm going to just create content so they can easily be able to like creating a catalog, be, be able to easily go through and um, see something that interests them um, that can help benefit them, you know, in their future. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting because my channel, a lot of the information that I get comes from books as well. It's kind of like, ideas I come across or ideas you steal or ideas you get inspired from. And then that sort of transforms into a subject that you can create a YouTube video about. So books, I totally resonate with that, with the whole, um, you know, gaining knowledge through books. But it's funny that you mention crypto because I had some crypto and I cashed it out. And that's what gave me money to be able to start my passion and videography, That's which crazy. ultimately led me into cameras, which got me into YouTube. Yeah. So it seems like me and you, we have very similar <laughs> um, history when it comes yeah. to the type of things we've done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tell me, what, what direction do you see you fully taking your, your content creating down the road? Mm. So at first, it was just like something for fun. Um, like, like I was just doing the fitness stuff as we were talking about off air. But before I got into YouTube, I was an entrepreneur for nine years. I had my own poker business. So I have no education and no skills in the real world. So when my poker business failed after nine years, I kind of had to get like a job and I was at the bottom of the totem pole basically. Imagine no skills, no profession, no education, no nothing. And so naturally I have this tendency to lean towards entrepreneurship and I somehow discovered cameras and I've always wanted to be a YouTuber because my best friend is a full-time YouTuber and my wife used to be a YouTuber. So I have all these people around me that were very successful on the platform. And so, and this is something that I always wanted to do. I always wanted to make YouTube videos, but the problem was I never knew what niche to make. I started off making videos about basketball. I'd, be, I'd play basketball like every week with my friends. I used to yeah. coach, I used to ref. Oh, that, man. Basketball that bombed. Sport. Yeah, that <laughs> didn't do well. And then I made um, videos about StarCraft, this video game that I loved. That didn't do well. And I did fitness. Like I just kept trying to find whatever niche that like somebody I was does really in college. passionate about. Like somebody does in college. is exactly what people do in college. They go in thinking that they want to do this before I, before I went into business, I was, I was in four years in high school. I was in a health Academy. I wanted to do sports mm. medicine and be a, uh, be a sport, uh, a team doctor. And I, I did a total 360 from that. So it's okay. It's, I hear what you're saying. You're, you were trying to discover like what, what, what route I should go. Yeah. And it takes a long, it, well, at least for me, it took me a long, long time. But now that I finally found out what it was and it's the self-development niche, I want to find a way to turn this into a full-time career where I can work from home, like how I did before with my poker business. Because now I have uh, a family, I have two kids that are like super young, like eight months and three years. Oh wow! So now I realize the value of being home. Right. That's super, super important for me. So this is why this whole YouTube business, podcast, streaming, everything that I do, it's to be able to turn this into a full time business where I can work from this office, like work from home. That's what's mm -hmm. like really meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. That's great, man. That's, that's great to hear. And 
and I would say somewhat the same for me. Um, I think, you know, it's weird because I, I really got into reading when I was about, man, I never read a book growing up. I think Me the too. first book, I, I, <laughs> the first book I read was Holes by Louis Sackar. You remember that movie Holes? Shia LaBeouf played in it. Um, oh, yeah. I can't remember. What, Maybe. I can't remember fully what it was about, but that was like one of the first books I read. And honestly, when I got into college, I got, I, I, I gained, it's crazy. It hit me. I had some type of thirst for knowledge. I think when college, when I got into college and also when my, when my brother died. So my brother was killed when I was 18. And, um, oh, wow. Sorry to hear that. Oh, oh I shit. appreciate it, man. Um, but things work out in specific ways for a reason. And, and it, and it turned my life totally around to where I became a lot more serious about life and actually having goals. Because before that it was, it was basketball and it was girls future. <laughs> like, I, I swear, I swear, like my oh. mind was nowhere else, <laughs> but basketball and girls like planning, planning ahead, like for future that, that was not something that I was doing. And it wasn't until I, those type of incidents where it really changed my outlook. <clears throat> so I started reading and it wasn't books at first. It was the wall street journal. Somehow I had gotten a, a free like yearly subscription uh, to the wall street journal. And I used to just read that, that um, newspaper. And then that slowly got me into books in the first book. I would say, I've read better books later down the road, I feel like, but I would say most um, life-changing was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. That changed mm. my, my total outlook on everything. Um, so that was kind of like that got the ball rolling. And then I went downhill from there. I, I started reading like everything I could get my hands on from biographies because I learned early that in order to become like these people that I see on TV or these people that I look up to, I needed to, um, I needed to figure out what they knew that other people didn't know because there, there's a science to, there's a science to gaining wealth. Um, people think it's luck and you know, they always say luck is when, um, preparation meets opportunity. And I believe in that. And, and there's a science to it. And when you start to, and what I love about Napoleon Hill is that Napoleon Hill, um, interviewed, you know, hundreds of other successful people to try to find out what it was that they all had in common. And, and when you look and pick at the things that they all had in common, you start to understand what the science is behind success from a monetary standpoint, because success could be anything, you know, I could be successful from, if I raise my kids, right. So just talking from a monetary sense, you can see um, <clears throat> what has created success in their life. So I wanted to find that recipe. So I would read books on <clears throat> old people, um, Abraham Lincoln, um, Elon Musk, um, Frederick Douglass, Malcolm X. I just wanted to understand great leaders in the, in, in the way they thought so I can train myself to think the same way. Um, <clears throat> so that really got me understanding myself in a way. Um, cause I always think that like self-reflection and, um, understanding yourself is one of the most important things you can do in your life, because, you know, when you, when you self-reflect, you know what you like and you know what you dislike and you know what matters and doesn't matter in life. And I found out that I love talking to, I love talking to people and I have great amount of wisdom, um, glory be to God, just for the amount of wisdom that I have that I'm able to pass to uh, other individuals. So I'm like, man, I would love to maybe be a life coach um, one day down the road to where I, I'm, I'm doing speeches at universities or doing speeches at um, TED Talks or events and mm -hmm. things like that. And people pay me to listen to the things that I have to say. Um, <clears throat> so that led me down that route. And I'm like, man, how do I get there? Like, nobody's going to pay me today for what I know. You know what I mean? I have to build that credibility 
uh, I had to build that credibility somehow. And that's when I started thinking um, YouTube. So I, I think of YouTube almost how like I look at Jay-Z, Jay-Z's career. Jay-Z became a rapper, but the rap, the, the rapping side of him, though some people say he's the best rapper that's lived, that wasn't that that was his foundation. That propelled him into bigger and better things. So I I look at YouTube that way as my foundation to propel me into other levels of life that I'm trying to reach, that I'm hoping that I can reach where maybe I'm like a Tony Robbins and I'm doing things of that nature. Um, and so you probably realize that you probably realized it a little sooner than I did. It took me like a minute to realize, you know, this is what I, but I was always on the search for um, self-awareness. A lot of people aren't searching. Um, a lot of people aren't self-aware. A lot of people aren't trying to find their purpose. And I think that we all have a purpose. God has given given us all a purpose. I mean, you're the one person selected out of hundreds of millions of sperm. That's not that's not by random. You we all have a purpose, but this purpose is out there. We don't know what it is, but it's on us to figure out what it is that we were born to do because we all do something better than the next person. But a lot of us never take the time to figure out what that is. And I'm I'm in a point in my life where I have understood what God um, brought me into this world to do. And, and I feel like it's the better people. And, and I know that because I do it for free. I would do it for free, gladly do it for free. And, and the thing about YouTube is if you don't, if you don't love what you do, you won't last because as you know, it isn't easy to get that ball rolling to where you're making money. And, and, and in the world we live in today, most people want things to come right away. And with YouTube, just like building a business, it takes time. And if you don't love what you do, you'll never, you'll, you'll never last. It'll weave out all the people way before, you know, they reach, some people get lucky and they catch the algorithm and they, 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 um, they become viral. But a lot of people become viral and they don't maintain it because it was it was more of just an uh, a, a random, a random thing. So I appreciate my slow grind um, because it, it builds true viewers. It builds a true audience, a true base, a base group of people that are going to constantly come to your video and constantly engage with your content. And it also is preparing me um just to, to to be able to weather difficult times because it's it's a struggle. I, I work a I, I work a job just like everybody, and I do this I do this on the side. This is also like work. So I'm trying to build this while having a job um, until I get to the point where this is maybe superseding what I'm making in my nine to five. And I can totally cut that off, but the cho I'll have that choice. The thing is, I'll have that choice. I don't know if I quit my job. I may, I may not. I may want the double income, but the the the, the ability to have that choice is what I'm I'm looking for. And I've always known that if I was going to work hard for for anything, it was going to be for something that I built. It's going to be for something that I own, and not for somebody else. I've never had the energy to to want to make um to want to work and fill the pockets of other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of like you're working 40 hours to fulfill someone else's dream, instead exactly. of putting it towards your own. But you know, what's interesting about the whole YouTube, um, why don't YouTube space, a lot of young people have come to me and asked me for YouTube advice. So, oh, they want to start a channel, oh, they want to be an influencer, they want to create an account. And what I usually tell them, it's like, so many people are addicted to instant gratification where they want to blow up right away. They want mm -hmm. to go viral in six months. But I'm like, you're willing to spend $100,000 and spend four years in university to get your degree, but you're not willing to spend $500 on a camera and put in that same four years into YouTube because that's what you need to do. You need to play the long game. But so many people think of YouTube as this like magical algorithm where Oh, well, if I just make this one video, it's going to take off. I'm going to explode. I'm going to be famous. And then I'm going to get all this influencer money. 
right? So many people started in the, with the wrong like mindset. And I know this because I had this small group of people that I started YouTube with around the same time. You know, we, we, we'd watch each other's videos. We'd leave comments, you know, try to be supportive. And now they're all gone except for one. There's only like me wow. and one other guy from when we, all the other channels are all dead. They haven't posted in like eight months, a year, a year and a half. And they all kind of just fall off because they never got that instant growth, like that blow up moment. Right. And I always try to tell other YouTubers or other people there that, that are just starting off their journeys. Like you got to try to see it as like the long game, like a four year degree. It's, it's like any other skill that you're trying to gain in life, put in your 10,000 hours, get like, get mastery like that's what you need to work towards I got, I not got just that book right behind <laughs> oh robert green yeah right. oh yeah man i got like four of these books <laughs> Ten thousand well, hours book. to, to master something yeah, yeah i read mastery last week i think i finished it last week yeah i just it, i just read that one it's a great great book man and it took me so long to actually get through it because when i read i, I write a ton like i i I do the most. Like I'll, I'll write, I'll write stuff that I, I'm like, oh man, that's intriguing. Like, and then I'm, from my creator side, I'm like, man, this is a, a great idea for a video. Like this idea, or and then like I may take something Robert Green is saying, and then elaborate on it, put my own like twist on it. You know what I mean? So that also, that's why the book plays a big part in my video creation because it also plays a big part of my creativity. It, it gets my um, stimuli going. I'm like, it. it <clears throat> I could read something, and then it just, it, and then I, I can go off on a tangent, like on two, three, like video ideas. Like, oh, these are based. This would be some great, um, great video ideas and con concepts. So, and then that gets me into. So, like for a video, I'll sh I have to structure it out. Like, I'm going to talk about this, talk about this, and talk about this. Um, I, I, that just come. That just came along with making you know videos over time at first it was kind of spitting off the top of my dome <clears throat> and and I, I just found that over time to be a little bit harder because if, if if i don't write down some things if i spit off the top of my dome i might forget things that i wanted to say in the video and then after i shoot the video i'm like oh man i wanted to say this i wanted <laughs> to you know what i mean so i almost treat it as like somebody would do for a speech if you were going to do a speech, you'll have certain certain points that to topics that you need to hit on. So I, that's how I I tend to treat my videos. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. In the beginning, my videos were very, very structured. I wrote everything out word for word. It was like totally, totally scripted. And now I've kind of gone the other way where I've sort of built up this self-confidence in the type of knowledge that I've acquired over the years through just through life experience, through books through conversations, through podcasts. Like I've learned so much from other people. So now I, I feel like as long as I know what the title is and what the thumbnail is going to be, like I always ask myself, how can I deliver on the promise of clicking that title or thumbnail? Like what is the meat and potatoes of this video? Like what are they clicking? Are they clicking to be entertained? Are they clicking to learn something? Like how can I fulfill that promise? And how can I fulfill that promise through a story? And so that's what I try to focus in on now because I feel like a lot of channels are overproduced and the whole like super scripted narrated stuff, it's, it's not as likable or it's not as enjoyable for me. I, I really like the... It isn't authentic. Like, yeah, the authenticity, like the you mm -hmm. in YouTube, right? It's individuals. Yeah. That's what I really love about the platform. Hmm. It's funny that you say that because <clears throat> I was just... <clears throat> so... I'm, I'm religious and my, 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 my under, I have religious undertones in some of my videos, but I've always like asked God to, to allow me to deliver it in a tasteful way because I never liked people to push religion down my throat. It, it, it turns people away. Mm -hmm. So I deliver it in a, in a tasteful way to where you still get value out of the video if whatever I said about God or Jesus or anything, whether I said, mention that person or not, you still get value out of it. So I always have asked him to allow me to push his word in a tasteful way. So 
I got into like a, a little debate because I'm very um I'm a religious person who who also does like pushback on my own religion. So I question things. And so in, in my means of questioning things, or not necessarily questioning things, but um looking for opposition, looking for videos out there that maybe oppose um the idea of God. So I got into it with, I didn't really get into it, but it was just like a, um, it, it was very surprising because I felt like he was just looking for me to respond. I'll tell you. So <laughs> I, it could, because I don't, I don't want to get too deep in it, but I was basically telling him, look, it's not my job to, to, to prove anything to you. Like that's, that's not, that's not the type of person I am. I'm not going to sell you on no hope. I'm not going to sell you on no fairy tales about God. What I'm going to do is tell you about my life. So usually I may start my videos by saying most of the stuff that I'm talking about is because I can, I think I, I have experienced something in my life that pertains to this subject. I like to give people real life um, examples. So that's where my authentic, uh, my authentic side comes in. So I was explaining to him how I seen how God has worked in my life. And I'll give you examples. And that's what I, I was doing. I was like, I'll give you examples for me. Now you have to look at your own life and see where things that maybe felt like they were impossible became possible. And for me, when my brother died, I was able, me and my mother were able to get through it a lot easier because we had, God to lean on versus my, my father, who isn't religious as much. He's became a little bit more as he's gotten older. And that may be the, uh, the finality of life. That may be because maybe he's getting closer to death. So, you know what I mean? Maybe when you start getting in that age, maybe you start to, to prepare and want to prepare and be, and, and make sure that you're safe in case there is an afterlife. So, I was saying I saw how my dad struggled with it. He, he he dealt with it like horribly. And it's because he didn't have like God to lean on. He didn't have that that comfort. I, I say it from that perspective. And then there's been other instances to where, you know, I mean, I was dating a girl for seven years and then we broke up. I lost my job. And I had gotten into a car accident all within like a month and a half. Damn. All within a month and a half, not trying to figure out how I'm going to pay rent next month and all this stuff. And every time, and this isn't the only scenario where I was like, um, um, where you're either going to make it or you're not. It's been, it's probably happened to me about three times in my life. And every time it has happened to me right when I needed it, right before they put me out on the streets. I was able to get a job and being able to, 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 to pay that rent. So I can only give people examples in my life where there has been something that's been outside of my body to help me to get through. So I always tell people, you got to look at your own life where there were situations where there was something outside of your control that helped you, you know, receive um, that blessing. And, 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 and I know like religion gets a, a negative connotation to it because it's, it's somewhat man-made. Um, so I always tell people, if you're not going to be religious, at least somewhat be somewhat spiritual to think that, to think that you have no creator is to say that you're God. And I know what the flaws that I have, I'm not, I, I, I'm not no God. <laughs> and I look at, <laughs> I look at, I look at all the creations of man. You look at all the creations of man and, and us to be the creator of those things that we create. Why is it so hard to believe that something created you? Whether it's the name Jesus, whether it's the name Jehovah, that doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. We, as a species, we give names to things that we don't, we give names to things just to be able to identify it. So the name doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's something that's bigger than you. And, and people are quicker to believe in, into like aliens and, and things that like things like that before they're quicker, before they're able to believe in something that created them. Um, 
Now, there's more, uh, you know, I mean, there's a shit ton of uh, different religions. Um, uh, to say that your religion is better than somebody else's religion, I don't play that. I don't, I, I don't play a part in that. Um, honestly, honestly, think a lot of religions are probably most likely praying to the same God, but that's that's some higher level understanding that I don't know. Um, and he may be using different religions to reach different groups of people because in certain areas, uh, I didn't grow up around Hinduism. So, you know what I mean? That's most likely, am I damned because I didn't grow up believing in Hinduism or I, uh, nobody really preached Hinduism to me. So I don't, I don't typically like to think of it that way. I typically like to think that um, uh, different religions, different groups were made, made possibly to reach different groups of people, but we're all somewhat praying to the same creator. That's just, that's just me. Whether that's true or not, that's another subject. That's just the way I think and how I've grown to, to uh, think just what my own experiences and how my brain has developed. Um, but yeah, I'd, my bad, man. I'd be going on a tangent sometimes. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's I'd be fine, going man. on it's, a tangent. Good, I'd be going on a tangent. <laughs> It's all good. I I appreciate the the religious stuff because I consider myself very fortunate to grow up in a city like Toronto that is super diverse, super multicultural. Like I've met so many different types of people from all walks of life. And I'm someone that doesn't necessarily believe, but also nor do I not disbelieve. So I'm always open to everything. And I've talked to a lot of people that are like Muslim or Christian or atheist. Like I had a guy on my podcast. Um, he has these three views on life that are completely counter to mine. But I enjoy talking to him because he's a smart guy. And I think it's good to learn about things that you don't necessarily agree with. Like say, for example, um, he, he's into like atheism, right? And I'm just like, hmm, that's how do you get there? Because you basically believe that God doesn't exist, but how do you prove that? So like, I'm not sure how you can kind of connect the dots to get there, but I think it's good for me as a person. I like to listen to all different types of perspectives on any subject. And I know it's, it's tough because in society we are told to never talk about these two dirty subjects, religion and politics. Sensitive. Right, and, and it's unfortunate because those subjects, again, are very sensitive. They're very polarizing. Either you're with me or you're against me. You're left or you're right. You're religious or you're not. And it's just it just creates this divide amongst people. And, and it's really hard to have like conversations with people that aren't open minded where they think, oh, this is my religion. It's the best. If you don't believe with me, then you're against me. And I hate that type of mindset. Right? I try to make sure that I'm always open to all different type of possibilities and perspectives or even just beliefs. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think those ones, those two are very touchy because they're, they're like moral based. And if you have different morals than I do, then we can't get along. And for me, and this is why I love the internet because it has, it has allowed me to be, a mentee to so many different people. Now, Louis Farrakhan is a, uh, he's Islamic. I, I'm not Islamic. I'm not Muslim, but I, there's, there's stuff that he says that I pull value from that I incorporate in my own way of thinking. And, and, and it maybe adds to my morals or it may, it maybe adds to certain things a part of me. Like, I can, I can like, for instance, you said politics. I like, I like um, ideas and concepts on both sides. Now, the thing about politics, they're two of the same tree. Now, it's, it's very similar to how people talk about Fox, CNN, and all these different networks when those networks are <laughs> primarily owned by some of the same families, like, some of the the, the 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 networks are very concentrated. Select family owns these different networks, and they're owned by the same family, so they're of the same tree. And if you think that whoever's in office has control, you're very wrong. It's this is this country is ran on capitalism. It's ran on big business. The businesses own the uh, what happens in this country. They put these particular lobbyists. They put these particular people in office to pass laws 
so that they can continue to reap benefits from from regular consumers. It's no different than it's um what's his name? Uh Rockefeller. Rockefeller said mm. um he said competition is a sin. And and to me that that sentence alone says so much because it, it just tells you the mind state of somebody with that type of wealth. So what does he do? He tries to use his money to to create this um to create monopolies so that nobody else can 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 compete with him and if you're able to compete with him it's because you either have great connections or you have the wealth they create these laws or they create these fences that just make it so hard for you to get in there so those are the people that are running it. It, it, it. To me, it's like it's like being a part of the matrix, and 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 they want you to 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 fight over this and that. Who's in office? Who's not in office? They want you to fight while they're over here pulling the strings and doing other things, like creating a universal currency that we might potentially one day be going into. Um, I was just listening to a guy talk the other day. He was talking about which makes so much sense to me. One day, he, he believes that one day people are going to have their money in the bank. And one day the bank is going to totally shut that off. And they're going to hand everybody a card and say, this is how you're going to uh, um, this is how your money is going to be. We're no longer accepting physical cash. Everything is all the physical cash, all that stuff is going to be gone away. And it's going to be a universal currency. I can see that. I can see that coming at some point. Um and that's why, you know, what I mean, crypto is around. I mean, just for decentralization and um, just the ability to have control over your funds, because you see what's happening right now where banks are small banks are failing now. Now, small banks are failing and who's helping helping them get out of trouble are the big banks. Now, who's going to help the big banks get out of trouble when things go bad? It's going to be the taxpayers. <laughs> yep. So it, it's yep. a domino. It's a domino. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's always going to fall back on us. We're always going to be this inflation, inflation, the price of goods coming, going up. OK, yes. We're, uh, uh, um, it, all it does is fall back on us. So they raise, they raise, they raise the, um, OK, they raise the minimum wages. But then that also means they raise the price of goods. So that raise of the minimum wage doesn't really matter because the price of goods are now higher. So you're back where you were. You're back at square one. So it's, <laughs> it, it, to me, we're always going to to suffer. We're always going to be the fill the people to feel the force of the brunt, the, the everyday consumers. So I, I just don't typically get into the politics um, because I just think it's minute and they, and they want you to fight over that because they want to keep you part of that system. They want you to continue to think that this is something that we should be fighting over um, while they're doing other stuff to set themselves up and, and to continue to push us down. You see the, the gap between uh, the middle class is almost gone sooner or later, man, it's going to be um, it's going to be pretty much poor and, and rich. And the thing is with capitalism People think capitalism has been around forever. It is still fairly young. Like of all the systems, capitalism is very young. And we still are trying to figure it out. And, and you see the struggle with the banking system. We are really struggling with the banking system because we're constantly having to just print money, print money. And we see what that's, what that's doing to not just us, but to the world. So, the world is going to change to a new form of currency before we do. You're seeing it in Africa where people are are, are going to different types of form of, uh, of currency, crypto or whatever it may be. They're looking for different, different ways of, of they're looking for different financial systems outside of the one that we're currently in. Um, so I just see that being that being trouble, being trouble down the road. So I'm just trying to make sure that I can be not, not Neo, not Morpheus. I don't want to be, <laughs> I, you know what I mean? I don't want to be <laughs> fighting the system, but I want my control within the system. I want to be like Agent Smith to where I'm bending the matrix to me. And I'm able to do all this stuff because I looked out for myself in the midst of all the chaos. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you know, is really alarming about the whole like inflation, COVID and all that type of stuff over here. The government was giving people, I think it was like $2,000 a month to stay home and not work while we had the You're lockdown. You're lying. You are lying. Yeah. So Two, we were getting were doing that in Canada. Yeah, they're getting. They call it like CERB. Like you're getting paid like two grand um, a month. Wow. And I I worked throughout the whole pandemic because I'm in logistics as like a courier, right? Oh yeah, I'm and in supply chain. I saw an insane influx in Aritzia and Lululemon packages to a point where it just <laughs> overflowed our production line, and we were just delivering Lululemon and Aritzia all day long and then after that it was all these amazon packages and then you you look oh the government gives all these people two thousand dollars you know oh we're giving you all money oh yeah this is awesome but then who gets rich the wealthy jeff bezos's stock or value of amazon goes up by 30 billion dollars throughout the pandemic record sales and i'm just like sitting here looking at all these packages this is where our money from the government for us to stay home we just went and bought went shopping on amazon yes. and bought yoga pants and whatever t-shirt clothing from Maritzia. This is what we we spend our money on. So at the end of the day, it's like the rich, they always just get rich anyway through politics, even though they go, oh yeah, we're going to give you some money. Please vote for me, right? I'm doing yeah. the right thing. But it's, it's, it's the people at, at the top, right? The lobbyists that pay the money to the politicians for that influence. They're the ones that always get rich anyway at the end of the day, yep. right? It, it just, yep, exactly. The money, it just funnels. It funnels up to the top. And I'm actually very surprised to see a lot of senators and stuff are, are kind of like going after some of them, like uh, Google, like Google has been this whole past 2022, Google was getting somewhat in trouble of um, they were considering them a monopoly um, in a way. So. I was just very surprised to see it. Some of them actually starting to attack some of these these big companies. Uh, but you 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 just see these CEOs are getting paid hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions. Like they can't be doing that much <laughs> to justify right. like that pay, that pay, and it's crazy. I mean, if you were to take a couple million of that and pay be, pay pay your employees more, it just I don't know. Things things are just so out of balance. And, and it's becoming ever more evident that there's there's an unbalance. Like, and you really see it. I really see it personally. Maybe because I'm at a stage where I'm looking to buy one. Is is homes? From when my dad was growing up, it was so much easier to buy homes. So you see the the the, the housing. You see the pricing of houses increase dramatically, but yet pay has only went up a little bit. So now, you know what I mean? You're looking at homes, average home in, in Tampa being somewhere around 350 to 400,000, but yet your salary is not that much more than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But yet when you go on Zillow, I can look at homes that are 350,000 today that were 98,000 10 years ago. So what sense does that make? That that just it's just so much harder to 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 live that you know what I mean it's just so much harder to live that same type of life that your parents would once lived and 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 that's greatly due to inflation. That's greatly due to overprinting of money. Like your and it makes it's it's easy to understand. Like you're you're watering down the value of the dollar, um, and. and that's going to be the thing is, is that we're trying to get through inflation right now, but yet we're going to be dealing with it even more because if, if banks are starting to fail, that's going to have to, that's going to get our federal reserve involved because if it, it's okay that it's been little banks so far because these bigger banks have been able to, to help these little banks. And that's a problem in itself because I seen a list the other day of all the banks, small banks that the big banks have uh, took over over the years, like the big banks like Chase, Bank of America. They have consumed a ton of small banks. And that, that creates a problem because now 
it's going to get to a point to where people are only going to be putting their money in these big banks. And that's what people are doing right now. They're, these little banks, people are on bank runs. Um, people with money are pulling their money out of these small banks and are now um, putting them into the big banks, like chasing them. It's very similar to crypto, how a lot of the, the platforms were going under because people were doing bank runs on those crypto sites. People were taking all their money off of there because they heard an inkling of a little bit of uh, issues. They're like, oh man, I need to get my money off of there. And the thing is, is when you put these money into these institutions, they're le they're lending your money out. They're lending your money out or they're doing that or they're investing it. So when you have a ton of money and you go to a bank and you say, hey, I want to pull $100,000 out, they make it very difficult for you to do so. And, and partly is because <laughs> they don't have it. <laughs> they don't have it. They don't have it. So they make you jump through hoops to get your money out because they really don't have it because it goes back to this um there's a book called The Creature from Jekyll Island and it taught and, and the book is oh my god everybody should read it because it it, it, it tells called? you The Creature from Jekyll Island Jekyll? and Jekyll Island yeah Jekyll Island it's um it's an island that's um I, I believe off of Georgia uh, um off the, the like the coast of Georgia or something like that um and so it talks about how the Federal Reserve was created and they put in laws that a bank only needed about a certain amount of funds on hand, actually physically in the bank. The rest of them, the rest of the money they can loan out, they can lend out. And that creates problems. And, and, and when the big banks fail, they say too big to fail because it, 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 uh, it'll fracture our whole um, financial system. That's when a Federal Reserve has to step in and print money to help bail them out. So when the Federal Reserve has to come in and print money to bail out these huge banks that are holding a ton of money, that creates inflation. So what happens at the end of the day, it always falls back on the everyday person. We're the ones who are going to pay for that. And, and, and our, our, our system, our country... It's about $3 trillion into debt. Now, what they're, what they're trying to do right now is they're trying to increase, um, increase um, uh, uh, interest, interest rates. They're trying to increase interest rates to slow down consumers from spending. They want us to stop spending. And when we stop spending, that means companies make less money. And then that means companies have to lay off people because they're making less money. So when they lay off people, that means the government gets less back in taxes. So we're treat three trillion dollars in debt. But how are we going to pay that debt off if we're increasing interest rates? So we have this forever bubble, this forever issue going on of of how do we pay this debt off? It's just, right. It's just, it's just, it's just a trouble. It's an issue. It's an issue. And, and the current system is, is so flawed and we have to find different means of like controlling our money. Basically long story short. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the interesting it's happening here in Canada too. And it's, um, it's really rough because this house that I'm in, I just bought it like a year ago and, I bought it at pretty much right the week before the interest rates started going up. And I've just been like totally crushed financially. Because Are you on like variable? Rates. Yeah, I have a variable mortgage. Mm. So like, you know, it's like, I don't know, it was like 2000 something. Then it's in the 3000. Now it's over 4000. I'm like, holy, like, like how, wow. how am I, how do I afford this? Like wow. I can't, I can't like go out to eat anymore like it's all home cooked meals no going out on the weekend yeah right and so then okay we got to go home cooked meals what does that mean go to the grocery store go to the grocery store prices are crazy for just like whatever bread of <laughs> cauliflower like a I, there was one day i couldn't buy celery because celery was like six dollars i was like bro i can't buy celery this is wild because i eat like celery and hummus every day that's like my go-to snack go -to. and i'm like bro i can't afford celery 
Like, what is this? <laughs> this is craziness. Like, there's like, this is the craziest time I've ever had to like pinch pennies. And yeah. Like everything about finances right now, it's, it's just wild. It's like a wild time to be alive. Yeah. And it allows companies to, to throw it back on supply chain issues. Oh, we're having supply chain issues. This is why we have, you know, we're, we're having to charge more. I know, I know just for me being in supply chain. So I work in, uh, I've done purchasing for probably the last four and a half, five years. So I know for a fact, uh, um, a lot of companies use supply chain as an issue to, um, to charge things at a higher price. I know that for, I know that for a fact. Uh, everything isn't supply chain. Granted, some things are. Some things are, I've, and I've worked in a lot of different industries. I've worked in um, paper. I've done paper industry. I've worked in seafood industry. I've worked in cosmetic. And um, I used to uh, work in purchasing for uh, a yacht manufacturer, a company that builds boats. So I've been in a lot oh, of different. Damn. Yeah, I've been a, out here in Florida. <laughs> of all, this oh, is yeah, the place. This, yeah, it makes sense. This is the place. Um, so, yeah, I've been, a, <clears throat> I've been in a lot of different industries. And I know for a fact that um, a lot of that is excuses. And you'll see when inflation goes down, let's see if the prices of items go down. They may go down a little bit, but what you saw uh, two, three years ago, you'll never see that again. You'll never see the pri those prices. And I'm looking at eggs, man. I get these little Nelly free range eggs that sell at Walmart. Man, those things are like uh, um, like six fifty or something now. And I'm like, I remember when they were like four something. And that's why I used to get them. But I mean, you went up, you went up two dollars, two dollars in a year. Mm -hmm. Crazy, crazy. Yeah, it, it's wild. And this is also another reason why I usually tell people it's like you got to have some type of side hustle, some type of side business, some passion project. Like you got to have something, even though like I used to make money as a freelance videographer and it obviously stopped because of COVID. But luckily, the oh, yeah, YouTube channel. Side note, side note. Bro, your your photography uh your uh, videography skills are on point <laughs> i was watching uh <laughs> Thanks, looking at bro. some of your main channel videos on your main channel i was like oh my man's nice with the camera <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was uh that was the original dream i wanted to have yeah. like, this videography business and it was going pretty good um but then covid lost all my clients but then youtube what's cool is like you get like adsense eventually and people give you like super chats and super stickers and you get donations if you do streams. And people have sent me like PayPal donations before too. Really? Super cool. Yeah, you get that sometimes. So I put that in your description in, of your videos. <laughs> put like a donation thing with a link. You'll be surprised yeah. Yeah. because people might watch a video that really helps them when they're feeling down or they're having like a really bad day. And they're like, you know what? That stoic blueprint guy. You know, he put a smile on my face today. He really helped me out when I was feeling depressed. And maybe I had suicidal thoughts about my life and everything sucks. And, you know, maybe he cheered me up and, you know, let's give back to this random YouTube guy that helped me out. And then, bam, you know, it happens sometimes. I just throw it out there just because people have told me to do it. But I never expected, you know, to get anything. Because I'm just like, yeah, I only have like 3,000 subscribers. But then every once in a while, people will surprise you with their kindness mm -hmm. and generosity. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's totally cool. It's funny that you say that because I was just, um, I was talking to my barber. I was like, man, like, I was like, this the YouTube, this YouTube thing is weird, man. I, I, I love it, but it's different because I, I get emails and stuff like from random people. And like, um, uh, this lady, <laughs> <laughs> this lady, Cecilia emailed me and she was Chinese. Like, <laughs> <laughs> It's always like random Chinese businesses. <laughs> I'd be skipping right over those emails. <laughs> I, I could tell, but by the subject, I was like, no, it's not for me. Delete, delete. And then you every once in a while, like I'll get one from an individual. I'll give you a perfect example. I had a, a lady write me and she was like, man, your vid video res resonated with me today, man. Um, you know, I, I've been going through ups and downs with my life. And this verse, um, this verse out of the Bible has always helped me get through. And, you know, so she just went on her little rant and was just talking about how she was so appreciative. And I was like, it, it's, it's, it's weird to know that you can create something and it can have an effect on somebody in that kind of way. 
because when I'm creating it, I'm not thinking, oh, who am I going who am I going to touch today? I'm going to touch somebody with this video. You know, I'm not thinking like that. I'm just creating it because it's what I love to do. And I'm hoping if one person gets value from it, cool. But I'm not looking for the emails. But when I do get them, I'm like, this is why. This is why. This is why I do it. This is why I do what I do. Um, and I, I got another, uh, another I, he had to be a kid. Um, but he was talking about how he doesn't have like real self-confidence when he goes out with his friends, he tries to put on an act and tries to act like he's confident and bold when he's really not. So he was asking me, Hey man, how can, how, how can I, um, how can I build my confidence so that I'm not feeling weak when I'm out in public and around people or around girls or around friends. And, and just for somebody to, to think that I can give them something valuable, they have no clue. You know what I mean? How that makes me feel and how appreciative um, I am of being able to serve because it, tying back to, to my religion, you know, the Bible really is about serving, serving one another. It's, it's about what can you do for somebody else? How can you uplift the next person? So that releases more dopamine out of me versus like any money, any, any amount of money could me being able to help somebody. And I think that's for most people. Most dopamine is the most dopamine in a person is released when they're doing for others, unless you're narcissistic or you really have some um, mental issues. But generally we're, 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 we're brought here to, to give, to serve. And so like, I'll go out of my way to help you out if, if you really need it. And I feel the best. I feel the most joy. I feel the most thankful to be able to do that for somebody because I've maybe have been in their shoes before where I wish I had somebody to reach out to. Hmm. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that that feeling of helping someone it's it's like a weird thing to explain to other people that don't understand but it feels good for like it help you gain from helping someone else because you feel good on the inside Absolutely. and i remember with my channel there was this girl who joined my first live stream like i think it was like two years ago and i'm streaming to myself like i have no one watching me i'm just streaming i'm practicing <laughs> and this one one girl comes in and she says hi you know just chatting with me hey cool someone's like, helping me out on the stream and she started coming to every single stream pretty much from the beginning and then i remember i you know i asked her you know what's your instagram like where do you live and she lives somewhere like in uh, eastern europe and i sent her a snap once of me at my parents house um, during Christmas, I was like in front of my Christmas tree with my daughter. I'd send her a snap like, hey, you know, like Merry Christmas, all the best, happy holidays, all that stuff. And then she sent me a snap back and she was like so thankful because in where she lives, they don't really celebrate Christmas. She only sees it through American television. Yeah. And it was like this very short and simple moment, but it was like it touched my heart kind of. And I had this like warm feeling on the inside, it, just like this very small moment in time it made me so happy mm -hmm. and i was so grateful for just having my channel you know all the haters and terrible comments that i've got it was all worth it for that one small moment of, in time where i touched this one girl's life who lives on a complete other side of the world you know and now when it was i think it was just her birthday on sunday so i got my daughter I'm like hey like let's send a set let's send her a snap you know say happy yeah. birthday right and it's like <laughs> it, like that type of stuff it, it makes me feel so good on the inside yeah and, and i mean and that's what you that's your gift this is your gift you know i mean you're fulfilling you're fulfilling that your purpose man and, and i and that, that that just lets me know it it, it reaffirms that i'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm doing something. You want to do things that are, that are bigger than you. And, and I think that's why I'm chasing that, that life coach because it's bigger than me. It's, 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 it's helping other people to reach a level of success because most of these people out here are lost. Most of these people out here don't believe in themselves. Most of them deal with mad insecurities, everything that I feel for myself. But I do think I'm a lot better 
with my mental state than than most people are. So my I feel my job and my duty is to help people to get into that right mental state. I grew up around people that were in the streets, like that sold drugs, that did all types of stuff, shot at people, all types of stuff. So I can connect to you if you are dealing with that same issue and you don't know how to get out of it. I dealt with a, a, a somewhat of a, a very loving relationship, but it became toxic during the end of it. I've dealt a, a long-term relationship. You you struggling with that. I can help you in some things that I have learned because the thing about me is I, 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 I take accountability and I, and I self-reflect. And most people don't do that. They'll walk away from relationships, not learn the thing from it and jump into another one where my relationship ended. I really sat for months and thought about what I did wrong. Why did I do the things that I did and how can I not make those same mistakes later down the road? Now, going through this process, I never thought that it was ever going to become content that I was ever going to create a video from it. But after I got through all that self-reflection, it became content. It became um, something for me to share with the world. And that's the authentic, that's the authentic side. That's a, that's the authentic aspect that people miss that you were mentioning before. A lot of people, a lot of people miss that aspect of it. And I think when you bring that authenticity to it, you really connect with people on a different level and they're more willing. And I think you're just more able to really build that, that real hardcore, I don't want to say fans, but group or people that, that look out for your videos because they know you're authentic with the things you say. My videos are not super polished. I don't really have, you know, great transitions or nothing because I just, and that's about you knowing your audience. And, and, and what you're trying to bring to your audience for some particular people's audiences, they, they look for that. They want the transitions. They want the, the different, you know, the different aspects for me, the audience that I'm trying to curate, that I'm trying to grow, they're coming here for a direct message. They're coming here for something informational, um, something specific. Like when I'm directing somebody towards a particular book, they should read. Is specific. And that's the type of, that's the type of niche that I'm trying to find myself in because like you were talking about earlier, it's like, man, where do I want to go in YouTube? There's a ton of personal development type of people, but what can I do that's different? <clears throat> and mine's, I think it's just bringing more of the authentic side and not so much being polished. Um, like my videos may have cut scenes to where, you know what I mean? Where maybe I said something wrong, I may cut it, but I would say mine's is a little bit more conversational, um, more intimate, more me and you um, having that heart to heart. I'm going to give it to you real raw and uncut. And, and that's the type of people that I want to gravitate towards those type of videos. That's the audience I'm looking for, along with me being <clears throat> a minority. <clears throat> There's not a ton of minorities in that space, in a, the personal self-development space. I, I, I mean, there's minorities, I would say specifically Black people, because I have came across different minority, different minority groups. You know, I, there's, a, there's a, a guy that I believe is Indian who's big in the personal development. I can't remember his name, but he's huge. Um, you know what I mean? So there's, <laughs> there's minorities, but, and I want to be able to give them a platform to shine. Um, or to just to be able to uh, talk to them, get to know. At the end of the day, it's also like um, the viewers aren't my viewers. So they may say something that strikes your viewers. And they're like, hey, I, man, that guy is talking some things that I like to hear. Let me check his his channel out. You know what I mean? So it's also networking. And I'm thinking about it in that type of light. And you have helped spark that, that creativity in me. Um, it just, just naturally. And, and, and I'm always just being very entrepreneurial. I'm always thinking, I'm always thinking of the next thing. 
how I can do some. I'm also I also majored in supply chain, and my my teacher was always better, faster, cheaper, and continuous improvement was always big. So I I, I think people view the world the way that they're taught. So like an engineer can go in a room and he can see something that's online and. You know, what I mean, he's going to look at that the, the the landscape. He's going to see things that aren't level. He's going to see the room based off of his knowledge. And my knowledge is um, continuous improvement, and it's always trying to find how we can continue to better ourselves. So when I naturally, when I naturally just naturally watch videos or I naturally talk to people, my mind is always churning. Hmm. Mm. I like I like that. I like what he said. Oh, hmm, that's a great idea. Maybe I should do this with my platform. Maybe switch it around. Maybe do it like this or do this. You know what I mean? So it gets that's how I am. I'm I'm very creative. And for the longest, I was trying to figure out <clears throat> how to pull that creativity out of me. Because for the longest, it was just basketball. Basketball was what I did. It was what I did outside of school. There was nothing, there was no hobbies that I was like, that allowed me to really express my creativity. And it wasn't until I started really thinking about doing videos on YouTube, I really was able to tap into that creativity. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome, man. What do you do to, what do you do to keep yourself in a creative space? In a creative space, mm. yeah, mentally to get your to get your mind buzzing and thinking of new ideas. What do you do? Is it traveling? Is it reading? Is it is it interviewing different podcasters? What do you do to 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 try to rejuvenate yourself um, and, and get yourself thinking thinking you know further down the road? Mm. It's it's kind of like. A com I don't know if there's one particular thing that I do that really helps with that. But one thing I do know is I read books in a very bizarre way. I buy the physical book as sort of like the end of the line. Um, and what I mean is that I'm usually having, I have like a ton of eBooks on my Kindle or I'm listening to a bunch of audio books. And all I'm trying to do is find really good ideas that really interest me. And then I'll go from the audio book, I'll get the ebook, and I'll kind of go through it. And if I think if I think it's a really, really good book, then I'll buy the physical copy and then go read it that way. And it's like, it's like a weird thing that I do. But what happens is I build up all these ideas in my sort of subconscious mind. And the way that I think about it is I can think my thoughts all day long, but it's not until I take them out and put them onto paper and make them real that they become a real idea. So I'm pretty scatterbrained. I, I'm thinking about basketball, the NBA, fitness, StarCraft, podcasting. I'm all, I'm all over the place. But <laughs> it's not until I can get those ideas onto like Google Docs or into my journal that all the creativity flows. And then I guess the one big thing for me, which people some people say is kind of controversial, is the use of psychedelic mushrooms. Um, I'm a pretty not heavy user, but an avid user of psilocybin. It unlocks this creative side of my mind in the 400 to 500 milligram range where I come up with these yeah. insane creative thoughts and ideas. I just are not possible without it. And so I've made a couple videos about my experiences with psychedelics and they've oddly done really well algorithmically, which is kind of funny. Uh, no, I've been, I've been watching. Them. <laughs> oh, you did? I've been watching them. They, yeah, no, no, I've been watching them. I've been watching them because, I, I, um, very, because shrooms, I mean, they may have a negative connotation to them somewhat, but they're good for you. Yeah. The negative is on the, the higher dose side. When you hallucinate, you see crazy shit. But what I'm talking about is like the microdose. You take a tiny, tiny amount. It's kind of like a morning cup of coffee. And what I like to do is I'll take a tiny amount. It's like a little capsule. It takes about 30 to 40 minutes. And then I'll write first thing in the morning. And my brain is like firing. It's just all these things going on. It's, it's super interesting. And that's what I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you are you strategically taking it or is it more just for like a fun recreational type of use? So microdosing is extremely strategic. I 
when I have a morning where I know my kids are going to sleep in or I'm going to wake up early and I have one to two hours to myself in my office, then I'll do either a three to 400 milligram um, microdose. If I want to have fun, like I did on my last live stream, I took 3000 grams, which is a <laughs> standard dose. Uh-huh. And I was tripping on this on the stream. In the middle of the stream, I I was seeing things. I was like mildly hallucinating. Give me an idea of a trip. Give me an idea. Like, see this painting? You think of the from from movies. You think of the wildest things when they trip. Like, give me an idea of your. So, like a standard trip, you'll have like a body high. Um, My vision improves. Colors are very bright, and then my pictures, the trees and the sky, they'll start to come out of the canvas in a three D space, and they'll sort of move. And you, those are like the mild hallucinations. This is like the 2,000 wow. to 3,000 gram or 2,000, 2,000 to 3,000 milligram. The times when you go over 5,000, this is like the heroic dose. This is when you see beings, deities, geometry, all kinds of wild, wild. That's like the more scary stuff. But the standard. Because I think I seen you have a video. Yeah, I did. I did one like and a, I recorded the whole lot, thing. An enormous amount. Yeah. <laughs> I, I sat on that video for over a year. Like, yeah, I, really? I tripped so hard. And I, and as I was coming down, I was writing everything in my Google Doc. And it was on my phone for over a year because I, I didn't know what to do with it. I'm like, what am I going to do with this? Am I going to make a video out of this? And at the time, I was like, no one wants to listen to my oh psychedelic trip that I had in at the Airbnb with my cousins. Like, no one's going to want to watch that. Be surprised. But then I, I really yeah. wanted to do it. Because that video, it was fun for me. So I got really creative with the shots that I used. And I wrote down specifically, like I saw these orange colors and these geometric lines. And I tried to use that with visuals and sound and music to kind of show you what I saw. And that video, it's like been going crazy, like in the algorithm recently. Yeah. What what got you into psychedelics? Was it a friend? Um, I think it's because... I'm, I can't really drink. Um, I'm allergic to alcohol. Mm. So. No way. Yeah. Really? Yes. Like severe, severe or like, um, kind of like, um, like a minor. Well, there's like this, I don't, I don't know if you call it like an Asian gene, but there's a lot of like Asian people have this like gene where they're allergic to alcohol or their liver doesn't process mm-hmm. it properly and mm-hmm. your face gets red and you throw up. That's why the Asian people have like the bright face. So I have some of that mm-hmm. through my mom. But but for whatever reason, I have terrible allergies to like wheat and grain and I guess it's like Mm. the hops or all that type of stuff. It just messes me up, makes me itchy. I get all red. And so on top of that, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life either. So imagine someone who doesn't drink, doesn't smoke. And then, you know, you have all your friends like a typical guy. Oh, let's get drunk. Let's smoke. Oh, Derek doesn't do that. What a loser. And so one guy's like, have you ever tried like mushrooms? And I was like, uh, no, <laughs> should I? <laughs> and so I tried it because I didn't really have any other substances. And I had a super positive experience. It was just maybe one gram. So not a lot. You know, I felt really happy. I had a body high. Everything was super bright. I was laughing a lot. It was really enjoyable. And after the experience, there's no hangover. There's no physical addiction. There's no craving to want more. And I could just go back to my life as normal. And I was like, oh, this is super cool. Really? Yeah. So like if I have like a 3,000 gram milligram um, trip, like on my stream, I can go six months, eight months without even doing it again. No problem. Like, there's no physical craving wow. or addiction at all. Like there's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. How long does it last, the trip, off of that amount? Uh, it lasted a good, I think it was like an hour, an hour and a half. I think um, it, it's oh, it's sort of like a graph, hard. right? It's like a bell curve. It's the slope is slow and then it peaks and then it starts it, to it come you down, but you're still tripping <laughs> as you're coming down. Right. But also it, it varies hmm. from person to person. A lot of people have told me three, you've done 3000 milligrams. That's like a crazy dose for me. Or other people it's like, Oh, I only do like 9,000, yeah. like 9,000. Like you're crazy. <laughs> what are you, like, what are you saying? So it varies, right? It varies. But generally, all positive experiences on across all doses, all dose levels. It's all been positive. There's been like nothing negative aside from like mild 
Nothing freaks you out. Well, see, the paranoia, I enjoy that anxiety. I enjoy the paranoia because it, it's sort of something that I like to embrace. I, I embrace the struggle. I'm not a very anxious person yeah. normally. Like some people can't deal with the anxiety. They're like, oh my God, I get too anxious. It's like marijuana, right? Oh, I can't, I can't deal with it, right? Yeah. But for me, I never really feel those feelings normally. So I kind of enjoy it. It's like a sort of like a challenge and I learn a lot from it. But again, that's just based off of my experience, right? What kind of paranoia? Is it like like you feeling like somebody's after you? Ooh, kind of yeah, it, it can get really it can get really dark. You, you can see like a somebody's somebody's trying to kill you. Yeah, <laughs> you can see like a being or a deity or a spirit, and it's like, what is this? The devil? Like you freak out. Like you you oh, really crazy. really freak out sometimes. Like I've had experiences yeah. with like these mushroom shadowy gods. I don't know how to explain them, and they're always like judging me. <laughs> looking down on me, like telling me that I'm a terrible human being. Like you have these very out of body experiences. They're very strange. But the thing that's interesting is that in the moment, you don't know that they're not real. So the way you react to that experience, is like as if it was a real experience. And one of those experiences was the feeling of my daughter dying. And it was like the worst wow. pain like I've ever felt. I cried my eyes out like the whole like it was horrible but yeah. in the yeah. moment i don't know that it's not real so the way my body reacts to that experience it's, it's you get everything the tears the sadness like the duress like yeah. oh everything it, it was just rough but then when you come out of it that's a crazy yes you, you gain perspective so now it's made me such a better father like i cherish my daughter and my son so much more now because i know what it's like to lose a child, right? I know what that pain is like because I've kind of felt it in this weird psychedelic trip. But again, when I come that out of it, crazy. if you have perspective and you can kind of reflect on what happened to you, even though it's not a real experience, the way I felt was real in the moment so I can learn from that. And so that's why I, I enjoy it. Do you say the average person, I mean, because I could tell, I mean, you have you have a level of intellect to you. Does the average person though come out with perspective? Generally, would generally, you say no? Most people that want shrooms, they do it for the fun, right? They they want to have the fun experience. They want to have not the crazy hallucinations. They want like the paint to come out of the canvas. <laughs> they want to see yeah, rainbows yeah, yeah. and interesting stuff in the forest. Not the feeling of no, the they, they don't want to go that far, <laughs> right? They like they want. It's like you know, getting drunk with the boys. It's fun. It's fun. Well, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I think mm -hmm. most people are looking for. <laughs> that's cool, man. That's cool. <laughs> that's crazy. That's crazy. I'm surprised that that a trip like that wouldn't have turned you away. Like I ain't trying to experience that again, or I'm at least cutting my dosage down. <laughs> yeah, there, there's this saying in the psychedelic community community called set and setting, and set means your mindset. And setting is your environment. And what you have to do is you have to go into the psychedelic trip with, in, with intent. So for my set, my mindset was I was going into this heroic dose with the perspective of I want to confront all my fears. I want to confront all my biases and personal bullshit that I have as an individual. And I want to come out of this as a better person. I want to face my fears, right? And so my set, my mindset going in was... I was open to whatever darkness I was going to see. And the environment, I was in a safe environment with my friends and my cousins. There was four of us total. We had an Airbnb where it was, it was in the middle of like a forest. It was super peaceful and isolated. There wasn't people around us to see what we were doing. And so I was very intentional with what I was doing during this psychedelic trip. And on top of that, I had my like notebook and stuff to take my notes while I could because eventually you, you lose motor function. Like you lose control of like even your tongue and your mouth and your hands. So this, really, yeah, th there's, there's parts where you can write stuff and then, and then all of a sudden you, your hands won't work anymore. So then you, you can't, then, then you go back to your notes. So like, I was very intentional with, with the, with the trip. Right. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> if you could tell me what's the, what's, what was, what was the most transformative book that you read? Like to your life, most transformative book. 
Oh, yeah. wow. That's, uh, I think I have two. The first one is definitely 1984 um, by George Orwell. Have you ever, never heard, you never of, heard of that? Oh, uh-huh. man. It, oh, it's like. Yeah, it's called 1984. It, so it, it has a lot of meaning to me because it's the first book that I read in high school. They forced us to read it. And then now, oh, so really? many years later in life, I reread it. Um, I bought it on my shelf back there. And it's also the year that I was born. And it basically talks about Big Brother. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it. And like George Orwell has all these insane ideas about how like government can control the populace. Like it's it's def it's the best like one of the best books I've ever read. It's it's unbelievable. Really? Yes, and, and a lot of his writings it applies to modern day. They call it Orwellian, like philosophy. So that book mm-hmm. like changed my life when it comes to perspective, when it comes to the world and community. But other than that, I think anything by Nassim Taleb has been really insightful for me, or Naval Ravikant. Um, I just mm-hmm. feel like those two guys, they have these really interesting insights and these really strange like one-liners um, when it comes to giving you advice onto life. Nassim is kind of like this arrogant author. His, I feel like his writing is very arrogant. He comes across as like this prick that knows it all. But there's something <laughs> beautiful about the way he talks about you want to take risk without going into ruin. You want to be like... a you want to support types of government like in a, in your community. Maybe you want to be a socialist with your family. You want to be a communist in your, um, in your neighborhood. You want to be um, like a liberal. Then at a higher state level, maybe you want to be conservative. And then at a countrywide level, maybe you want to be a libertarian. Like he gives you these very interesting ideas that you can apply to your life. And even though some of his writing, as I said, is a little aggressive um, for my taste, but just a brilliant, brilliant writer. Yeah, I would say mines right now. My favorite, my favorite book is actually a book that you've read. I saw that you had it in one of your videos. Oh yeah, um, I would say it's one of my top top three uh, atomic habits. Oh, by, James uh, Clear. James Clear. <laughs> yes, yes, that's one of my favorite books. Um, I would say my favorite author right now would have to probably be Ryan Holiday. He's oh a, the Daily um, Stoic. He. Daily yes, Stoic, yeah. 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 Um, I, I love, I love his books, and he's the one who who greatly got me into uh, Stoicism. So I, um, I come from a family that that has <laughs> short tempers, <laughs> um, short tempers. And they're Detroit people, man. And, and I always <laughs> say, people? like Detroit, <laughs> they're their own type of people. They're their own special breed. Like, it's just hard to explain. Like, my ex, when I took her to Detroit, I was trying to explain. I was like, well, these are the Detroit people. Like, they're different. And, and she had an idea of what I meant after, like, going there. Um, Just just in general, like, just the people there are just different. They, they're quick temper. They're, they're hotheads. Like, um, they have attitudes all the time. They act like it's a problem. Every time I go to, a, like, a fast food place... They act like it's a problem for me to say no tomatoes. Like anything else? Like, like, <laughs> you, like, like you got a problem? Cause <laughs> like, like, what's your issue? Like you almost want to check people. Like, um, but me always trying to better myself. I love stoicism because it, it's primarily like a, a living philosophy of like how to live. And, um, and I was really introduced to like perception and how what's causing my reaction to things is how I'm perceiving it. And I have the choice to decide how I want to perceive something. I have the choice over that. I don't have the choice. The, the, the thing about stoicism they, they talk about is focus on things that you're in control of and the things that you aren't to just leave them alone, to not deal with them. You have, you can't change anything about it. You have no control over it. So focus on the things that you are in control of. And what I am in control of is how I perceive things. So I actually had made a video on like failures 
because most of the time failures have a, have a, a negative like connotation to them to like they're a bad thing. Um, but I always see them. I always uh, do you have a specific destination you're trying to get through, get to when you fail. You're just taking a longer route to get to that destination. Mm. So, but you're learning, you're learning along the way to get to that destination. Now, if I do things correctly the first time I'm there in 30 minutes, but failing allows me to take that, that hour trip to get to the same place. But along that road, I'm gaining so much. I'm building so much wisdom, gaining so much knowledge that when I get to that destination, I'm going to be such a better, well-rounded individual than that person who will reach success off of the first run because it builds character. I'm used to failing in life. So I'm used to hard times. I, I, I love the J. Cole line is beauty in the struggle mm. because it builds character. So when I, when I encounter another situation that involves me maybe having patience or maybe me dealing with a, a, a tough time in, in the Bible, in the Bible, they call it seasons or they call it wilderness. So when Moses freed the people from Egypt, they were happy. Hey, we're free. We're no longer slaves to the Egyptians. But soon after that, they started cursing God because they were struggling finding meat. They were struggling getting food. So then they started to go back and be like, man, I wish we were back in Egypt. I wish we were slaves again. At least I was, you know what I mean? I was eating better then oh. than I am now. And because they started to curse God, God put them, left them in um, the wilderness for 40 years. So a lot of people apply that to their life. Most of us are going to go through seasons in our life, difficult times. But we have to stay focused on the destination because I mess up in something. I it, it goes back to Ryan Holiday. He has a line that says, what isn't the way becomes the way. Mm -hmm. So when I fail at something, I know that's I, I know I can't do it that way. You learn from that mistake. You learn from that lesson. And now, you know, I can't do it that way. I must have to do it this way. And in supply chain, when I had a, I was in, I was in, did an internship with General Motors. It was tough, but I loved it because when I showed up, it was at a foundry where they, they pour, pour iron and stuff like that. They gave me a problem. They wanted me to solve it. They didn't tell me anything. They just threw me out there. Go solve this problem. I didn't know how the factory ran. I didn't even know what they <laughs> were making there. So I had to learn. I had to learn all of that. I had to learn all of that. I had to learn each different station and what they did. And in order to try to generate a root cause. So there's a root cause. And usually people think the first problem is the issue. It's the reason why things aren't working, but it's usually something deeper. You usually have to dig deeper to figure out what that root cause is. Um, and so I just, I, I, I like take that things that I learn in my life. Like I, I love to apply them. I love to apply them to my, 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 my normal life, my everyday life. Now I know that I can't do it that way. I have to focus on doing it this way. I have to, I have to learn from these mistakes. You know, the famous line by Einstein, um, you know, about insanity, mm -hmm. doing the same thing and expecting a different result. And, and so many of us continuously do the same thing over and over and over. And we continue to fail at it, thinking that something's going to change. A lot of people start businesses and they, they, they fail to pay attention to financials. That business fails and then they start another business. And they continue to, to fail to, to put importance on understanding financials <laughs> and they expect things are going to change. <laughs> you have in finance, the financial aspect of, of a business is it's like a core co competency. Like you have to know how much you're spending in order to know 
what you should price things at in order to know how much you're going to make off that individual unit. So knowing those numbers are, are so important, yet I continuously watch shows on entrepreneur entrepreneurship, whether it's Restaurant Impossible, whether it's Bar Rescue. I continuously watch these shows and see the same thing over and over and over. And, and they'll come in and the first thing that ask you, what are the finances? What are your, where are your financial papers? Uh, how much is the company making? Uh, how much is the company spending? They never have the answers to those numbers. And how do you know whether you're making money or not? How do you know if the company's thriving, <laughs> thriving or not? If you don't know your finances. So I try to only get burnt once when it comes to things. And I try to learn from it after being burnt once instead of continuously burning myself. Mm. <laughs> Well said, bro. Well said. Hey, man, unfortunately, I got to wrap up the, the pod. But uh, this was a great conversation, man. We should do it uh, again in the Excellent, future. Excellent, man. Excellent, <laughs> man. I, and I just appreciate you, you know what I mean, opening up your platform to um, growing creators, man. That's that's commendable. Um, and like I said, it has sparked my own ideas moving forward for my own platform mm -hmm. oh yeah love let's plug all your channels social media where can people find your work um yeah um so my channel is the stoic blueprint that's t-h-e space s-t-o-i-c space blueprint um i guess i should spell that out b-l-u-e-p-r-i-n-t um and i make i make content on personal growth personal development if you're looking to better yourself with finances, if you're looking to um, get yourself in a better mental space of, uh, of just correcting some of the negative things you've been doing in your life, man, I talk about a lot of those things over there. And um, on Instagram, you can find me at Remain Blessed. Um, that's R-E-M-A-I-N-B-L-E-S-S-E-D, Remain Blessed. All right, awesome. Uh, thanks again, Corey. I'll put uh, links in the description for anyone that wants to uh, check out his work. And this was an awesome podcast, bro. Thanks again for doing it. Thank you, Derek, man. I hope you have a good one, man. And I hope to link up with you sometime <laughs> in the future again. You too, bro. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Peace. Peace.